with this uh, session today, the session today we try to run like we run LSEC. We don't do things after the schedule, but even before. It's now 11.29. And we start the ha second half of this morning, again with local circuits, and again with a good friend, again with a scientist who knows Israeli scientists, a scientist who brought us one of our new recruits, Mickey London, a scientist we love very much, Michael Hauser. I am happy to introduce you to this audience and have you here. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you very much for this very kind introduction, and uh, thanks uh, to all of you for the invitation. It's great to be here to, uh, to celebrate the remarkable history of the ICNC and also the opening of the new door uh, represented by LSEC. So neural circuits are incredibly complicated, and as you heard in Bert Sackman's talk, each circuit consists of many different cell types, and the interconnectivity of these cell types is still uh, just beginning to be um, explored. So um, furthermore, during behavior, activity in these circuits um, uh, engages thousands to millions of cells on millisecond time scales. So making the link between activity patterns in these circuits, and in particular making the link between computation and behavior in such circuits is going to be incredibly complicated. So one way to cut through this complexity is to ask, were within such a circuit, could computations be implemented? What, what, what is the actual physical or, or biophysical substrate of computations um, in such a circuit? And the answer of, of this guy to this question, Cajal, Ramon Cajal, the famous Spanish neuroanatomist, um, was the neuron doctrine, which stated that uh, single neurons are the, the fundamental, functional, anatomical, uh, metabolic, and biochemical building blocks of the nervous system, indivisible. Now, in my talk today, what I want to do is challenge um, the, this uh, supposition and instead propose that there may be actually uh, lower levels of organization, even within um, single, single neurons, where computational mechanisms might be implemented. And over the past couple of decades, um, there's uh, been a lot of work into uh, dendritic mechanisms which have um, <clears throat> shown us that actually uh, we might be able to implement computations on a range of spatial scales, even within single neurons. We know from uh, uh, work on single spines that even single spines can have a sophisticated biochemical apparatus that can already start to implement basic computations. We know that uh, neighboring spines can, for example, share second messengers and so implement coordinated plasticity rules um, among neighboring spines. We know that uh, dendritic branches can trigger dendritic spikes and implement computational rules. And we also know that entire dendritic regions can receive uh, different kinds of synaptic inputs and therefore uh, allowing uh, local individual processing rules depending on the nature of the input. So in order to ask which of these particular levels um, might implement computational rules that are relevant to behavior and that are engaged to, during behavior, it's, of course, important to integrate between levels. And <clears throat> um, what we need to do is we need to uh, connect these uh, mechanisms on the cellular level um, to actually what's going on in behavior. We need to be able to um, uh, see um, which of these mechanisms might actually uh, uh, give us, uh, reveal computational principles that could be useful for specific behavioral tasks. So, um, of course, it's important to define what kind of uh, computations that uh, we're interested in. And here, just let me give you uh, an example of a real-world computation that, that some of you may be familiar with and which engages mechanisms that um, uh, all of us are using in our daily life. So this is um, uh, an image from uh, a famous football match, the Euro 2012 final, which happened a few months ago. And um, it represents basically uh, a computational duel uh, between the Spanish uh, striker here, Torres, who's facing off against the um, Italian keeper, uh, Gigi Buffon. And <clears throat> um, basically what these guys are doing are complementary computations. 
striker here needs to uh, keep track of the position of the keeper with respect to the goal, which is up here, which um, he himself needs to uh, discriminate um, from a very complicated background. Um, and he needs, needs to then launch the ball um, in the direction of the, of, of the goal mouth uh, while missing the keeper. And of course, the keeper needs to do the complementary comp computation. He needs to uh, obviously uh, uh, localize the ball um, uh, with respect to the, uh, um, uh, the striker here, Torres. Needs to uh, predict from the movements of the striker uh, what he's going to do with the ball. And once the ball is launched, he needs to uh, in turn launch himself in the correct uh, direction to, to intercept um, the ball. And <clears throat> this is now the, the result of, of uh, this computational duo. Um, as you can see, Torres has scored, uh, has scored the goal. Buffon is frustrated here. Torres celebrating here in the background. And um, this computation is taking place over the time course of, of milliseconds, right? Um, this, this very complex series um, of computations um, happens uh, nearly instantaneously and, and completely effortless, effortlessly for these players. And um, basically, um, the, the prevailing view about how this happens um, in the uh, uh, sensory motor uh, uh, cortices that are they're engaged during um, these tasks is that this involves uh, computations taking place on the circuit level, engaging thousands of, uh, or, or millions of, of neurons in population activity. But what I'd like to ask today is, is whether such uh, uh, computations might actually already be implemented um, on the level of uh, single neurons and already on the level of single dendrites. And so what I want to ask is, are there uh, biophysical properties, are there mechanisms in dendrites um, that might be relevant to the kind of computations that are being carried out here um, on the behavioral level? Okay, so <clears throat> um, this idea, uh, of course, is, is not new, and we know uh, for example, starting from the uh, uh, magnificent theoretical work of Wilfred Rall, uh, 50 years ago, um, that even passive uh, linear cables can already start to implement some uh, rudimentary uh, computations of sequences that, that might actually be relevant to this kind of task. So <clears throat> here we have um, the original figure from the, the book chapter written by Rall in 64, um, uh, showing that um, a passive linear cable um, can already start to differentially uh, read out uh, sequences of activation um, um, along this uh, uh, passive linear cable um, based on the differential filtering of um, uh, individual EP EPSBs depending on their location. Now, Rawls shows that this holds true um, in, in a very simple uh, case, a very uh, long passive linear cable. And we know, of course, from experimental work that uh, dendrites of neurons, in particular dendrites of pyramidal cells, are, are not passive and are not linear. In fact, they, they're, they are endowed with a wide range of voltage-gated channels, uh, and, uh, endowing them with excitability. And this has been explored with uh, patch clamp recordings uh, directly from uh, dendrites of, of pyramidal cells. Here, here's a few examples here um, showing double patch recordings from the soma and dendrites of pyramidal cells showing different kinds of, of dendritic spikes. It's also been explored using uh, calcium imaging techniques and uncaging techniques, um, looking at the requirements for initiation of these dendritic spikes. And there's also been some uh, very heroic uh, attempts uh, to record from uh, dendrites in vivo, which have also exhibited uh, uh, these kinds of excitability uh, dendritic spikes um, in vivo. So the big question is, uh, clearly, dendrites are excitable. They can generate um, active events like dendritic spikes. Um, how might these excitable properties actually be engaged in a computational task that's relevant to behavior? So <clears throat> in today's talk, I'm going to present you um, with uh, three uh, pieces of evidence. Um, the dendrites can do some uh, interesting computational tasks relevant to behavior. I'm first going to tell you about how dendrites might be able to read out uh, the timing of synaptic inputs. Um, then I'm going to show you how uh, dendrites might be able to read out spatiotemporal sequences, and so discriminate different <coughs> patterns of synaptic inputs. And finally, I'm going to show you how some of these active dendritic mechanisms might be useful in vivo um, for a, a behaviorally relevant computational task. So first of all, um, how dendrites can read out input timing. Why is this important? It's important because there's uh, an ongoing unresolved debate about the importance of spike timing in neurons. 
And this has uh, uh, been engaged, uh, the battle has been joined by, by two camps, uh, the spike rate and the spike timing camps, which have uh, uh, inspired uh, a number of different computational theories, um, uh, engaging these different mechanisms. And the debate is, uh, is still unresolved. Um, let's explain why, why it's important and how, and how it's uh, relevant on the single cell level. So here we have uh, a, a kind of a dream experiment where we can record um, from a single neuron uh, record its uh, spike output, and at the same time, record all of um, its, its inputs, uh, and record the input spike patterns of all the inputs. So we're going to start with a neuron, um, which is going to implement a, a rate coding scheme. And so where the output spike pattern um, uh, broadly reflects the, the averaged activity across its um, uh, synaptic inputs. And so you can see here, um, we have an increase in spike rate uh, in this period here, which reflects an increase uh, and spike rate averaged over um, uh, the inputs as shown here. So now what we're going to do is, um, <clears throat> and this is of course uh, consistent with a, a slow time window of integration um, producing a, a rate coding um, scheme for this particular neuron. Now what we're going to do is, is we're going to keep everything the same, but we're going to switch to a, a rapid time window of integration in the cell. Um, and uh, with the same, exactly the same pattern of inputs, um, we have, you can see, a very different um, pattern of output spikes, um, where we only uh, get an output spike when we have uh, coincident input spikes because of the nar very nar narrow time window of synaptic integration in the postsynaptic cell. And here we can see the second spike um, is, is only happening because, again, we have coincidence of the presynaptic spikes. So this neuron is, is now a coincidence detector and has a very a fundamentally different um, mode of information processing um, to the rate coding neuron uh, shown initially with the same uh, pattern of input. So my question is now, how can uh, the properties of dendrites contribute to uh, determining which of these codes is used by a single neuron, uh, which in turn is going to have a big influence on the kind of coding strategies used by uh, neural circuits implementing these particular elements? So. <clears throat> um, what we need to do is we need to uh, actually uh, be able to measure the uh, integration time constant, if you like, um, of single neurons. And here's an experiment from um, a C1 pyramidal cell by Massimo Scanziani showing a, a, a classic example of temporal integration in a pyramidal cell, where uh, here we're starting at the resting potential and uh, Massimo stimulating the uh, Schaefer collateral excitatory afferents to the pyramidal cell uh, repetitively, producing temporal summation which eventually leads to an output spike. OK, so the real question now is, how can the properties of, of the dendrites of this pyramidal cell contribute to setting this time window of integration um, in, in the pyramidal cell uh, and determining the output uh, spiking pattern of this neuron? So to do this, we, we need to be able to manipulate synaptic inputs to dendrites with the necessary spatiotemporal precision to be able to play in arbitrary patterns of synaptic input. And that's something that's very difficult to do with conventional stimulation electrodes, which allow a good control over timing, but very little control over um, the spatial distribution of active synaptic inputs. So here's how we do this in the experiment. We start with um, acute brain slices from somatosensory and visual cortex. We're doing experiments in layer two, three pyramidal cells from barrel cortex or visual cortex. We patch the neurons uh, with the whole cell patch clamp technique, fill the neurons with the fluorescent dye, allowing us to visualize the structure using two-photon microscopy. Then, to be able to deliver synaptic inputs with the necessary spatiotemporal precision, um, we use two-photon glutamate uncaging, which involves um, uh, using a, a cage group, which is then cleaved very spatially precisely by two-photon excitation, um, which is shown here in this uh, uh, textbook picture from Brad Amos, showing the uh, extremely uh, small focal volume uh, achieved by two-photon excitation. And um, we use a molecule called MNI glutamate. This is a caged glutamate compound, um, which has a good two-photon cross-section, allowing you to use it to uh, mimic synaptic transmission by uh, uh, using the uh, very small focal volume of uh, two-photon excitation to map the distribution of active glutamate receptors, first shown here by um, Haro Kasai's group now um, over 10 years ago. Um, and they use this compound to, to map uh, the distribution of active AMPA receptor <clears throat> glutamate receptors on the surface of cultured uh, pyramidal cells. Here's how we use this in, in our experiments. 
Um, here's now a, a basal dendrite of a layer 2, 3 pyramidal cell filled with a fluorescent dye, imaged with a two photon microscope. You can see the individual uh, spines here. We now bathe this dendrite with the cage compound, ammoniglutamate, and then we can target activation of individual spine synapses um, by focusing our two photon excitation onto individual spine heads. Here's one example. Here's the simultaneous recording at the soma, whole cell recording at the soma, showing you the response to a two photon encaging and glutamate at, at this spine head. And to show you that we have the necessary spatial precision, we simply move the encaging spot uh, a couple of microns to the left, and you can see that um, basically we, we wipe out the response. There's no response left. So this approach now gives us the necessary spatial and temporal precision to play in arbitrary spatial temporal patterns of input. So now what we can do is we can define the input-output function of single dendrites um, with uh, this, this approach. Um, here's the setup of the experiment. We patch a layer 2 through pyramidal cell. Um, we identify um, individual spines, and then we activate them with two photon glutamate uh, caging. This shows you the response recorded at the soma to um, uh, uncaging at the individual spine heads. And now what we want to do is we want to activate them uh, all together uh, to, to define the input-output function um, of this, uh, uh, this set of spines, of this dendrite. This is now showing you um, the recorded EPSPs as we uh, ramp up the number of synapses contributing to the response. And this is the, the algebraic, the, the linear sum of the individual uh, responses activated independently. And this is now the input-output function, plotting now the measured EPSP against the expected linear sum. And you can see that um, for this set of inputs, halfway up this basal dendrite of the layer 2-3 three, three pyramidal cell, we have a nicely sigmoidal and highly superlinear input-output function. Now we can repeat this experiment at different locations along the same single dendrite to see if this input-output function changes as a function of distance from the soma. And that's shown here. This is pooled data from a, a large number of experiments from uh, individual dendrites of layer 2, 3 pyramidal cells. Um, and what we did is we divided each dendrite into three sections, uh, the base, the middle, and the tip. And if we first uh, focus on the, uh, the data from the middle of the dendrite, you can see that we have this nice sigmoidal input-output function, as I showed you before. If we now repeat the experiments at the tip of the dendrite, we can see that the sigmoid becomes much steeper and then saturates. But if we repeat it at the base of the dendrite, you can see that there's a much, much shallower curve which doesn't saturate. So this tells us already that a single dendrite is not um, a uniform structure. The input-output function depends on where the inputs are. So <clears throat> we can now further analyze this data in terms of, uh, for example, the gain of the input-output function. And you can see that the steepness of the sigmoid, sigmoid uh, depends um, uh, uh, critically on where you, all, where you are along the dendrite, going from a very shallow slope to a very steep slope. And this is also accompanied by an increase in the degree of superlinearity of summation, going from basically linear summation at the base of the dendrite up to highly superlinear summation and a very high input-output gain at the tip of the dendrite. OK, so there's a gradient of integration, therefore, um, along each individual dendrite. What's the mechanism? Well, we know there's a range of different voltage-gated channels, active uh, processes in, in these dendrites. Um, and one of them is actually the um, NMDA receptor itself, which is uh, uh, voltage-sensitive due to the voltage-dependent magnesium block. So what we did is we blocked NMDA receptors with APV, repeated the experiments, and basically this linearized the input-output function, showing that activation of NMDA receptor channels is crucial for this nonlinear input-output curve. And we also tried uh, uh, blockers of voltage-gated channels, such as uh, blockers of sodium channels and calcium channels. And these also had an effect of uh, dampening the superlinearity. But it's clear that um, uh, what's essential for the superlinearity, what's necessary to kick it off, is uh, recruiting the nonlinearity of the um, uh, NMDA receptor itself. OK, so <clears throat> um, what is the mechanism, therefore, of this gradient? Well, it needs two components. It needs, first of all, a source of uh, nonlinearity. And that's, uh, as I mentioned before, provided by the voltage-dependent magnesium block um, of the uh, pore of the NDA receptor channel. Here's the original paper uh, from Philippe Scher's group um, showing this. Um, this is the, the IV curve of single NDA receptor channels in the presence of two, two millimolar physiological external magnesium, um, producing this U-shaped curve here. Input, uh, 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 current voltage relationship, and this is what happens when you remove external magnesium where it becomes linearized. And you can see that around the resting potential, <laughs> this is very steep negative slope, 
um, which, is their, uh, which is responsible for the uh, superlinearity that we see. But we need not just a source of superlinearity, we also need some index of location along the dendrite. And that's actually provided by a, a fundamental biophysical feature of the dendritic architecture itself, which is that each dendrite is not just floating in space, but dendrites are all uh, connected to something else. They're either connected to another dendrite or they're connected to the soma. Okay? And this gives you a, a fundamental physical asymmetry of dendritic structure, which in turn has uh, a profound imp impact on the biophysical properties of the dendrite. In particular, what it does is it, it produces a gradient of impedance along the dendrite. And that's shown here in this very simple ball and stick model of the neuron. Here's the soma, um, here's our dendrite. It's, uh, the, the structure of the dendrite is, is completely uniform, as you can see. But nonetheless, we have a, a steep gradient of impedance along the dendrite going from a region of low impedance, where it's meeting the electrical load imposed by the soma, up to a region of very high impedance, uh, input impedance um, at the tip of the dendrite because of the sealed end of the dendrite. Now, what this means is that this, this structural asymmetry is going to have a big impact on the local depolarization produced by individual synaptic inputs, depending on their location. So if we start with a synaptic conductance, uh, which we place near the tip of the dendrite, it's going to meet a high local input impedance and therefore produce a large local depolarization. Exactly the same synaptic conductance placed at the base of the dendrite will meet a, a, a very low local input impedance and a small local depolarization. So you can see that basically um, if you put a synaptic conductance at the tip of the dendrite, you will have a much larger local de depolarization, which will have a much greater chance of, per of harnessing the nonlinear mechanisms that are present um, in the dend dendritic membrane. And so basically, um, this gradient of synaptic integration is a consequence of this impedance gradient multiplied by the nonlinearity imparted by the NMDA receptor channel. And these are, these are two basic features which are common to almost every dendrite in the brain. We know that all dendrites must have this, this asymmetry. It's built into their structure, producing this impedance gradient. And we know that um, nearly all glutamate uh, synapses in the brain have NMDA receptor channels. So we think this may be actually a, a, a fundamental uh, a template for producing such uh, a gradient of integrative properties along single dendrites. OK, so I mentioned uh, before that we really were interested in timing. And so let's start to look at um, what, hap what this integration gradient means for um, uh, encoding of, of time information um, in synaptic inputs delivered to individual dendrites. So here now what we do is instead of um, activating all the inputs uh, uh, close to synchronously, what we do is we're going to change the millisecond timing of, it, of the individual inputs delivered to the dendrite. And this is um, <clears throat> now shown here. And what we did is we activated the same number of inputs either at the base of a dendrite or at the tip of the dendrite, changing the spacing of activation of the individual inputs from one millisecond to eight millisecond. And you can see here that for the, the basal inputs, um, the somatic response is highly sensitive to the millisecond timing of the individual inputs. And if we repeat this experiment for the distal inputs, we can see that the somatic response, the EPSP, is basically insensitive to the timing of the inputs. Here's the population data. For inputs to the tip, you can see that the somatic EPSP is basically insensitive to the timing, whereas inputs to the base are highly sensitive to the millisecond timing of the inputs. And you can ex express this also as a temporal summation index showing you that summation is very effective um, for inputs to the tip and very ineffective for inputs at the base. So this tells us that not only is there an integration gradient in terms of the input-output function, but that proximal and distal inputs, uh, input patterns, are read out differentially um, um, by the same dendrite. So um, what does this uh, mean for integration of physiological patterns of inputs delivered across the dendritic tree? So here we used compartmental modeling. Um, we, we took a reconstruction, digital reconstruction of a layer 2, 3 pyramidal cell. Um, and the aim was to, to make the simplest possible model that would capture the features of the experimental data. We found we could get away with uh, a, a model with an active axon, a hot axon, to trigger action potentials, a passive dendrite with synapses um, uh, expressing both AMPA and NBA type uh, glutamate receptors. And with a simple model, we could reproduce the basic features of the experimental results. Um, such as the uh, differential dependence on, on uh, uh, timing 
uh, depending on if the inputs are, are proximal or distal, um, and the, uh, the gradient of, of the input-output function with distance along the dendrite. So now what we can do, as shown here, now what we can do is we can now take this model and we can explore a much wider range of uh, uh, spatial and temporal input patterns than we can in the experiment. And what we can do, in fact, is we can reproduce an in vivo-like input pattern um, distributed across the dendritic tree. And the aim of this uh, simulation was to see um, how the output pattern of the neuron uh, uh, might be different depending on how you distribute the, the, the same number of synapses, either on the distal tip or on the, the base of the same dendrites. So what we did is we took this, uh, again, the same number of inputs, and we either put these inputs on the tip of a dendrite or on the base of the same dendrite, and activated them with the same um, <coughs> basically Poisson uh, input spike train. So here's the, the input uh, spiking pattern that we delivered to these synapses, and now here's the output spike train that um, we, we measured uh, from the axon of this neuron. And the prediction we had, uh, the, the kind of um, a basic assumption we had uh, based on passive cable theory is that um, the distal input should be far less effective at triggering output spikes um, than the proximal inputs because they should be much more filtered by the cable um, than the proximal inputs. And in fact, as you can see here, exactly the, the opposite turned out to be true. With exactly the same um, input pattern, in vivo-like input pattern, we got far more output action potentials from the axon um, for the distal inputs uh, compared to the, exactly the same number of proximal inputs, okay? And this is now uh, exploring parameter spaces a, a bit. You can see that over a wide range of excitation frequencies, distal always wins um, over the proximal inputs, activating this exactly the same number of inputs with the same input pattern. So this is a, a, a big uh, surprise to us because what it means is that the distal inputs can basically overcome their electrotonic disadvantage, right? The prediction was that distal input should be much more filtered by the cable and proximal inputs, but it seems that the gradient of the input-output function that we show and the higher sensitivity of distal inputs, uh, combined with the fact that they're much less sensitive to the millisecond timing of the inputs, means that you can actually uh, get uh, more spikes from distal inputs than you can from proximal inputs, meaning that uh, the, the, the distal inputs can compensate for their electrotonic disadvantage. Okay, so I've shown you so far that um, we have input-output gradients along even single dendrites, so single dendrites are not uniform, that temporal summation is much more efficient for distal inputs than for proximal inputs, so that means that <clears throat> um, we can actually uh, perhaps use this information to reconcile this ongoing debate between uh, rate coding and, and temporal coding in pyramidal cells, because basically um, single neurons and even single dendrites can do both, depending on the distribution of input patterns um, along individual dendrites. And I've shown you that already single dendrites can already perform some interesting differential computations on their inputs, depending on how they're distributed along the dendrite. Okay, so the next question is, um, can dendrites not just uh, read out differential timing of individual inputs, but also uh, read out differential sequences. So I've shown you that uh, temporal integration depends on where you are um, along the dendrite for a given set of inputs. What happens if we distribute the inputs along a dendrite, which is of course more phys physiological, can we actually read out temporal sequences um, played into an individual dendrite? So here's why this is important. Here's another thought experiment. A primal cell um, getting three inputs along a single dendrite. And if this primal cell is unable to distinguish the temporal sequence of these three inputs, you can see that there's basically just one representation of these three inputs. If, on the other hand, uh, this primal neuron can distinguish the sequence of activation of these three inputs, so in other words, if ABC is not equal to BCA, and of course there's um, analogies in, in, in daily life where we do this all the time, then you can immediately see that you wind up with a much richer set of representations of these three inputs. Um, in the output pattern of, of the of the cell. <laughs> so again, Wilfred Rall um, uh, predicted that already in, in, in linear passive cables, you could have some kind of sequence sensitivity imparted by the, by the differential filtering of inputs arriving at different locations along the, along the cable, producing a rudimentary form of direct and selectivity. And so our experimental strategy was to test this actually in uh, primal cells, which we know 
have active dendrites as I've shown you previously. So here, again, we have uh, uh, patched layer 2 3 pyramidal cells. We identified individual spine synapses along a single dendrite. We activated them individually. And then we asked, what if we activate them in a sequence um, along the dendrite? And the simplest possible sequence is either activating them um, in the on direction, so from the tip to the base, or the reverse direction from the base to the tip. So this is now showing you activation of eight individual inputs in a sequence um, from the tip to the base of the dendrite. And here's now what happens when you activate exactly the same synapses, but simply in the reverse the direction. And this is now showing you the off response, which you can see is significantly smaller than the on response. So this is now um, the population data showing you that the on response always wins over the off response over a wide range of input amplitudes. And <clears throat> this is a overall a highly significant result. So this tells us that already single dendrites can start to read out sequences of input played along the dendrite. And this tells us also an impact on the output of the cell. As shown here, um, we activated just enough inputs to produce um, a spikes on 50% of the trials. When we activate the inputs in the off direction, if we just reverse the direction of actuation, we can see that the same inputs produce far more output spikes. And it gets, again, it's a highly significant difference. So we can read out this difference, not, not just in EPSP peak, but also in terms of spike output from the cell. Um, and we can also uh, change the, uh, the velocity of activation of the individual inputs, um, uh, change the activation speed, the gap between the individual inputs. And you can see that over a wide range of input speeds, um, again, on wins over off. The red trace is always bigger than the blue trace. Um, <clears throat> this is the population data, again, showing that um, on is always bigger than off. And you can um, also see if you now uh, uh, subtract these curves, you can see that the, uh, the peak difference um, uh, depends on the input velocity. There's a, a, an optimal input velocity for producing the largest on-off difference. And so that means that we can not only read out direction of activation, but also uh, we can read out the speed of activation. And <clears throat> we know that NMDA receptors um, uh, deliver calcium um, signals to the dendrite. And so what we wanted to see if there's also a local readout of the direction of activation. We did this by um, uh, uh, doing the experiment in combination with uh, two-photon calcium imaging from the same dendrite. Um, here's the setup of the experiment. We, we followed calcium signals along the trajectory of the dendrite um, uh, with a wiggly line scan. And this is now showing you a spatiotemporal plot of the calcium signal when activating this set of synapses in the on direction at two different speeds. So time is on the x-axis. The spatial dimension is on the y-axis. And calcium is coded by color. And you can see that um, we get widespread calcium signals along this dendrite um, when activating these inputs in the on direction at both of these speeds. And when simply reversing the direction of activation in, in uh, interleaf trials, you can see that in the off direction, we get a much smaller calcium signal. And that's uh, shown here um, more clearly in this movie. Here's the calcium signal produced in this dendrite by activating the synapses in the on direction. You can see that um, there's a large calcium signal throughout the dendrite. In the off direction, the calcium signal is much, much smaller throughout the dendrite. Is there the same velocity That's right, yeah. So um, this is now showing you um, that uh, the, uh, this is the calcium signal. This is basically a three-dimensional plot of the data I showed you before. Uh, time is on this axis. Um, spatial dimension is on this axis. And calcium is, is coded by, by color and also by the mountain. And you can see that um, uh, over uh, a, a long time period, the calcium signal is much larger in the on direction um, throughout the dendrite than in the off direction. Um, we can also re uh, read out the input velocity, and we can also uh, see that we have the same optimal velocity for discriminating on versus off. So what I've shown you is that single dendrites are already sensitive to the direction of activation of inputs and also to the velocity of activation. And we can read this out in terms of local calcium influx, which is obviously going to be important for plasticity mechanisms. Uh, somatic peak voltage, the PSP that's arriving at the soma, and also the axonal action potential output. So what's the mechanism of this? Well, basically, it's the same underlying mechanism that's driving these uh, input-output gradients that I showed you before, um, in that if we block NMDA receptors with AP5, um, we uh, wipe out this, these, the sequence selectivity that I showed you before. It be basically becomes um, equivalent to the linear sum, and the red and the blue traces become the same. It wipes out the, uh, also the velocity sensitivity, and the difference between on and off is no longer significant. 
So clearly also um, for sequence selectivity, NMD receptors are crucial um, for this mechanism. And <clears throat> as I showed you before, it's a combination of this gradient of input impedance along the dendrite multiplied by the nonlinearity um, produced by the NMDA receptor channel by physics. And you can see that essentially if you start off a sequence at the tip of the dendrite, you're going to much more quickly pick up the large depolarizations that are needed to recruit the nonlinearity um, than when you start the sequence at the base of the dendrite. Okay? <laughs> So um, uh, just returning to, to the original uh, computational uh, uh, challenge here, um, of course, in vivo during behavior when um, neurons are, are performing these kind of computations, it's likely that, that the inputs, the relevant inputs, are not going to be delivered onto single dendrites but are going to be distributed. Um, so we address this question um, instead of probing the properties of single dendrites to see if this, a similar mechanism might be engaged when we have more distributed forms of input. Here's how we do the experiment. Um, we distribute um, a large number of inputs across the dendritic tree. Um, again, activate them in a sequence here from uh, 1 to 13 and 13 to 1. And you can see that the somatic response to these two sequences are significantly different. Um, to show that NMDA receptor mechanisms are engaged, we can now hyperpolarize the cell, um, which prevents NMDA receptor uh, nonlinearities. And you can see that now um, the, uh, the two sequences are basically identical. We can now make a, a model of this experiment as shown here. We can reconstruct the same cell. We can place uh, uh, simulated synapses at exactly the same location. We can now repeat the input sequence that we delivered in the experiment and get very similar results. And in the model, of course, we can um, uh, take out um, NMDA, NMDA receptors and show that just like in the experiment, um, this, the, the sequence selectivity um, uh, relies on NMDA receptor activation. Okay, so this shows us that also with um, distributed forms of input, as you might expect in vivo, we still have um, this, this sequence selectivity imparted by the active properties of the dendrites. And now with this model, we can now explore the parameter space in a much richer way than we can with the experiments where we're, uh, we're time limited. And here we can use the same model now to um, activate a very large number of synapses, um, 150 synapses, in arbitrary spatiotemporal patterns and, and see how this neuron can then discriminate um, these different patterns of input. And <clears throat> this is now showing you the distribution of EPSP peak amplitudes produced by um, um, activation of, of random, uh, a thousand uh, random spatiotemporal patterns, sequences of input um, delivered to these 150 synapses. And you can see this, this produces a really broad distribution of EPSP peak amplitudes um, at the soma of this pyramidal cell. And if we now use as an index of discriminabil discriminability of two patterns, um, <clears throat> a one millivolt peak-to-peak -peak difference um, of, of the uh, somatic EPSP peak, we can show that the uh, discrimination probability um, with a large number of activated synapses in a particular pattern can approach 50%. So this is um, a, 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 an important result because it shows us that even with um, physiological numbers of inputs, large number of inputs active in random spatiotemporal patterns to this layer to the three pyramidal cell, we can have a, a sig significant probability of discriminating um, two particular input patterns delivered to this dendritic tree. So I've shown you um, with both experiments and simulations that indeed single dendrites can read out input sequences. We can discriminate ABC from BCA. And by a, a, a cheeky analogy to the uh, genetic code, we can, we can propose that this may be a new mechanism for uh, uh, representing information um, on the level of, of single cells. And given that this is going to differentially engage uh, plasticity mechanisms because of the differential calcium signal, it may be also a, a representative a, a new strategy for, for storing different patterns of input um, delivered to the dendritic tree. Okay, so I've shown you so far um, some mechanisms by which uh, single dendrites can help neurons um, solve uh, simple computational problems. Um, but I've shown you this in a slice preparation. Um, it's important now to, to show that we can actually um, engage similar mechanisms um, in vivo in the intact brain um, to show that these mechanisms might be useful for performing behaviorally relevant computations. And um, so here we've, we've now, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about a, a, a new project that we, we've been doing. Um, we're, we're, we're dressing 
uh, a very basic computation carried out by, by a sensory cortex, uh, namely the visual cortex, which is computation of, of orientation of a, of a visual stimulus. And um, this is the, uh, the classic paper by, by Hubel and Wiesel um, showing you the, the response, the selective response of a pyramidal cell and primary visual cortex um, to the orientation of a uh, uh, bar. And they explained this orientation selectivity um, by the simple feedforward uh, network model, um, but uh, where, where the, the individual inputs are, are linear summing units. But we know, of course, um, from uh, the work that I've, I've described to you over the past half an hour, that of course uh, uh, dendrites are not linear summing uh, neurons are not linear summing units, but have active uh, dendrites have active properties. Um, and uh, the work of Bartlett Malins proposed that um, each dendrite might actually uh, represent an individual computational uh, subunit. And indeed, actually, um, looking in, in the work of uh, David Hubel in this review, um, here published um, you know, quite a few years ago, that already um, uh, Hubel himself uh, suggested that uh, perhaps dendrites could perform uh, some element of this rudimentary computation. And <clears throat> we think this is a, a, a fascinating problem because it, it, it allows us, um, gives us the opportunity uh, to test how a computational problem that's behaviorally relevant, namely uh, a detection of the orientation of the stimulus, uh, uh, might uh, engage some of these dendritic mechanisms um, that I've been talking about. So how we can uh, uh, explain uh, a computational feature um, with a dendritic, specific dendritic mechanism. Okay, so the way we do this is by uh, being able to make direct patch clump recordings um, from dendrites in vivo. Uh, we do this in, in anesthetized mice. Um, where we can uh, um, visualize uh, the dendritic tree of uh, pyramidal cells in, in layer 2-3 that we made patch clump recordings from. Um, here's the, uh, the details of the, the visual stimulus that we provide. Um, here's the, uh, the uh, anesthetic conditions that we use in the experiments um, that have been done in adult mice. And we also um, use a, an approach for making targeted, rec targeted recordings from the soma and dendrites of these neurons I developed in the lab that we call shadow patching, where we basically fill the extracellular space with, with a highly fluorescent dye. We image um, uh, the dye using a two-photon microscope, um, uh, and the individual uh, neurons are revealed by uh, their so-called shadow because they, they don't take up the dye. They're not fluorescent. And you can use this uh, the shadow image, if you like, to then um, approach uh, to target a particular cell of interest and make a direct patch clamp recording uh, from it. And then uh, once you've reached the whole cell configuration, fill the cell with a fluorescent dye and uh, look at its structure. So this is now the, the physiology of a later three pyramidal cell under our conditions. Um, you can see there's uh, barrages of spontaneous activity um, happening without visual stimulation. And here's the, the response to um, uh, a, a grating showing you the uh, strong uh, spiking response uh, to the preferred orientation against the uh, the much weaker response in the or orthogonal orientation, uh, the hallmark of um, an orientation-selective response in, in visual cortex. So, of course, we want to see what happens in dendrites. Here's now um, a two-photon image of a later three pyramidal cell where we've made a dendritic patch clamp recording. Um, initially, using uh, the blind approach, we then turn on the two-photon microscope so we can see exactly where we're recording from the dendrite. This is about um, uh, 70 microns from the soma of this recording. And this is what the physiology looks like um, here spontaneously. Uh, spontaneous activity recorded at uh, a dendrite 116 microns from the soma. You can see again barrages of synaptic input, which are crowned by occasional uh, uh, backpropagating action potentials as shown here. And <clears throat> um, we can now uh, uh, compare the properties of these action potentials recorded at the soma. And in dendritic recordings, you can see that there's a substantial um, attenuation of the backpropagating spike um, at the dendritic recording sites and also a broadening of the backpropagating action potential. This is uh, quite similar to uh, slice work performed by Matthew Larkin um, and colleagues <coughs> and also to, to in vivo work uh, performed by Jack Waters, Matthew Larkin, uh, Freddie Falmkin and Bert Sackman um, in barrel cortex. So <coughs> what happens though when we give a visual stimulus? What do the, the dendritic visual responses look like? Well, basically, uh, this is now a dendritic recording, about 100 microns from the soma. Uh, 
showing you the, the response to visual stimulus at the preferred and at the uh, non-preferred, the orthogonal orientation. And you can see that actually uh, the dendritic uh, voltage response looks very, very different from the somatic spiking response that I showed you. Essentially, all hell breaks loose on the dendrite. At the preferred orientation, we see these uh, really remarkable uh, visually evoked, evoked uh, bursts of spikes riding on these large depolarizations. Um, these bursts are orientation tuned. Um, <clears throat> this is now showing you the response in the preferred direction and uh, the successive responses as we gradually move away from the preferred orientation. You can see that um, at 90 degrees in the preferred orientation, essentially the, the bursts are wiped out. And here's the uh, uh, corresponding polar plot showing the tuning of these bursts. Um, looking more closely at these bursts, we can see there's a, there's a very wide spectrum of uh, responsiveness in these dendritic recordings when activating um, uh, the neurons at the preferred with the, the, the preferred orientation. You, we can see that um, uh, these visually evo evoked bursts have an extremely high rate. Um, the, the amplitudes are very, very variable from event to event. There doesn't seem to be a systematic um, uh, sequence of amplitudes from event to event. Sometimes big follows small and vice versa. And we can see that also there's a, there's a remarkable diversity in the width of these spikes going from very, very fast, uh, apparently sodium uh, uh, mediated dendritic spikes as shown here to these really, really broad uh, 10 to 20 millisecond long uh, apparent dendritic calcium spikes as shown here. So basically uh, there's a, a remarkable diversity of uh, active dendritic events triggered by visual stimulus. So the, um, uh, the first question to, 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 to address is whether these um, uh, spikes that we see in the dendrite evoked by preferred visual stimulus might simply be backpropagating spikes um, which, which are, uh, arise from the soma. And <clears throat> of course, the, in a slice, the way to address this question is to do a simultaneous recording from the soma and the dendrite of the same cell to look at uh, the relationship between the two events. That's, of course, impossible in vivo. So what we can do, though, is we can look at the statistics of the evoked events at the two locations under the same conditions. And here, um, what we're doing is we're simply looking at the, the maximum uh, spike rates evoked by the same visual stimulus in the same conditions for somatic and dendritic recordings. And you can see that the um, evoked spike rates, both in terms of the maximal firing rate and the mean firing rate, are very different for distal dendritic recordings and somatic recordings, um, uh, indicating that uh, basically we cannot account for the distal spikes with somatic action potentials. That uh, you can see that the distal spike rates approach um, actually 500 hertz which is much, much faster than you ever see um, a layer 2, 3 parietal cell firing at the soma. Um, we, we can also look at the uh, morphology of the action potentials. And this is now showing you the uh, morphology of the, the backpropagating action potentials, which have a, a relatively uniform um, rise time um, amplitude and half width. And this is now the, uh, the shape of the uh, dendritic spike bursts evoked by the preferred visual stimulus. And you can see that these, while there's some overlap with, with the backpropagating active population, uh, we, you can see there's a huge spectrum of rise times, um, uh, peak amplitudes, and half widths, showing you um, that we cannot account for most of these dendritic spikes with backpropagating action potentials. And, and, and a final piece of evidence is that <clears throat> one signature um, of a locally generated event, uh, active event, uh, uh, versus a propagated active event um, is its, its onset, um, is, is the voltage uh, profile at its onset. And this is actually uh, a work that was originally developed by, by Hodgkin Huxley, um, sh uh, looking at propagated action potentials in the squid axon, but which was uh, reprised recently by uh, David McCormick's group, um, showing that basically um, uh, uh, propagated spikes, so for example, action potentials initiated in the axon, and recorded at the soma uh, tend to have a, a very sharp kink in their onset, um, as shown most clearly in this uh, DVDT versus VM plot here, showing this very sharp kink in the onset of the spike, uh, compared to action potentials recorded at the site of initiation, um, which show much more rounded onset. And this is reflected um, in the two kinds of um, active events that we record in the dendrites. So the putative back propagated spikes that we record. Um, uh, exhibit this sharp kink in the voltage onset that, that, that are the hallmark of a propagated event, so an event that's uh, 
initiated far away, here presumably in the axon, and then propagated to the dendritic reporting site. And in contrast, the, the uh, dendritically evoked spike bursts that we see have a much more rounded onset, um, a signature of a locally generated event. So in other words, a dendritic spike initiated in um, the dendrite they're recording from. And <clears throat> again, these have, um, uh, the difference between these events is highly significant. Um, um, another important signature of an active event, of course, must be that it's highly vol voltage sensitive. And this is now showing you um, the effect of uh, very mild hyperpolarization on the, the frequency of these active events. Here's now um, dendritic bursts evoked by the uh, preferred visual stimulus um, under control conditions, so with no current injection, so at resting potential, so to speak. And here's what happens when we hyperpolarize the membrane potential by a few millivolts with a um, very mild current injection by the dendritic uh, patch clamp electrode. And you can see that um, this dramatically reduces the uh, frequency of these um, uh, dendritic spike bursts, and uh, population data is highly, highly significant. And um, finally, since we know that um, active mechanisms um, result from engagement of NMDA receptor channels, uh, we can uh, block these uh, selectively with the intracellular blocker MK801. This is now showing you uh, a visually evoked dendritic spike bursts recorded from the dendrite with in, in, uh, recording with a normal uh, patch pipette solution. And here's uh, the same experiment repeated with the patch pipette containing uh, the selective intracellular blocker of NMDA receptors MK801. And you can see that basically the dendritic spike bursts um, disappear. So clearly these are also NMDA receptor dependent active events. And this is now showing you that uh, basically it's a significant, highly significant reduction of these dendritic spike bursts um, when we block NMDA receptors intracellularly. OK, so just a, a quick interim summary of these experiments. I've shown you that by making direct recordings from the dendrites, um, that visual input um, triggers very large bursty uh, dendritic spikes in distal dendrites. Uh, we've shown that we cannot account for these events uh, by backpropagating action potentials. They're, they um, have all the ha hallmarks of being dendritic spikes. Um, these dendritic spike bursts are, are tuned. They're highly selective to the orientation of the visual stimulus. And they're very sensitive to um, hyperpolarization and NMDA receptor blockers, um, as, you, as we might expect for an active event. OK, so the big question, of course, is how can these um, active events, these dendritic uh, uh, spikes, uh, contribute to the computation that's being performed by these pyramidal cells? So here's how we address this question. Um, <clears throat> again, we cannot do the double recording from the dendrite and the soma, which would allow us to see what the dendrite is telling the soma. But what we can do is we can record from the soma, and we can actually uh, uh, record what is arriving at the soma um, uh, from the computations that are being carried out um, in the dendrites. So this is now showing you the, the, um, uh, the action potentials um, uh, triggered uh, by different um, orientations of the visual stimulus, showing the orientation selective response. And here's, this is now the, the sub-threshold membrane potential that's underlying um, this uh, um, uh, selective uh, response to the visual stimulus. This is now um, uh, showing you the, the polar plot for the, the action potential uh, response recorded at the soma. And this is now the um, orientation selectivity of subthreshold membrane potential, which of course underlies this selective spiking response. And you can see that um, uh, they're both oriented to the same uh, orientation, have the same preferred orientation. Here's the pr uh, um, population data showing you the um, orientation selectivity of the spiking response in the cell versus the orientation selectivity of the subthreshold membrane potential, which um, underlies, of course, um, the, uh, the tuning of the output spike response. And so now what we can do is we can close the loop um, because we know that the, uh, the tuning of and the, the uh, triggering of dendritic spikes is highly sensitive to <laughs> membrane potential. So now we can hyperpolarize um, the cell by current injection of the soma to see how this affects the, the tuning of the voltage response. Here's now the, the, the uh, tuning of the subthreshold membrane potential under control conditions. And when we hyperpolarize the membrane potential by between 5 and 10 millivolts, and we can see this um, basically wipes out the subthreshold sub tuning of the voltage response. Um, here's now the, the entire um, um, gamut of, of angles that we tested, showing that uh, we can wipe out the orientation tuning of the subthreshold membrane potential by hyperpolarization. And um, here's now the um, uh, population data 
uh, showing that um, across the recordings, we can uh, dramatically reduce the orientation tuning of the subthreshold memory potential um, simply by hyperpolarizing the memory potential, as we'd expect um, from the sensitivity of the dendritic spikes to membrane potential. Another thing we can do is we can also make um, uh, dendritic, uh, we can make recordings in which we um, put MK801 in, in the uh, patch pipette and, and show how uh, blocking NMDA receptor channels in the dendrites can affect the tuning of the subthreshold membrane potential. And <clears throat> um, uh, this is now, first of all, showing the, the subthreshold membrane potential tuning um, early in the recording, just after break in, um, before the MK01 has, has had time to diffuse into the dendrites. And you can see that um, there's a, a clear tuning of the subthreshold memory potential response. And later on in the recording, after 10 minutes or so, when the MK01 has diffused um, into, the, uh, into the dendrites, blocked MDA receptors intracellularly, we can see that the uh, subthreshold memory potential tuning is dramatically reduced, um, and also the orientation selectivity. Um, is also correspondingly re reduced. So we can now close the loop and show that by um, uh, uh, manipulating these dendritic mechanisms, either by hyperpolarization or blocking NMDA receptor uh, superlinearity, we can also uh, uh, reduce the tuning of subthreshold mem memory potential and also uh, uh, affect the, the output tuning of these pyramidal cells. So in summary, I've shown you that um, uh, with the uh, direct dendritic recordings that uh, Oriented visual input uh, selectively engages dendritic spikes in these layer 2, 3 pyramidal cells. Um, these dendritic spikes have the expected properties. Um, they're sensitive to hyperpolarization. They're blocked um, by blocking NMDA receptor channels. And <coughs> we've shown that the subthreshold membrane potential that's arriving at the soma um, shows uh, the same tuning as the output uh, spikes um, of the same cells. And that we can um, use mechanisms which block the uh, active properties of the dendrites, block dendritic spikes, um, and also uh, uh, reduce the orientation tuning of subthreshold membrane potential and also the output of the cell, closing the loop and allowing us to conclude that um, the active mechanisms, the dendritic spikes engaged by the sensory input, uh, contribute to orientation tuning and, and therefore allow us to provide um, a biophysical mechanism, a dendritic mechanism for um, a cellular computation that's relevant to behavior. So finally, thanks to the people that uh, did the work. I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, Tiago Branco, who together with Beverly Clark did the um, two photon encaging experiments um, in single dendrites and multiple dendrites and slices. Uh, Spencer Smith um, did the recordings from dendrites um, in vivo in layer 2, 3 pyramidal cells. Kazuo Kitamura and Ben Yudkovitz uh, invented the, uh, the shadow patching technique, and I also want to thank Andrew for helping with the modeling and uh, the funders for funding the work. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I mean, um, in the simulations that I showed, um, the distribution is essentially uniform, so all of the synapses have the same density of energy receptors, the same properties. And so the, the gradient that I showed you essentially arises strictly from the non-uniform cable properties along the single dendrite. So, so it means that you don't, you don't need any kind of non-uniformities in the channels to produce this gradient. Although if you have, yes? That's right, yeah. So um, he's asking, what if there's a, a plasticity in the distribution of NMDA receptor channels along the dendrite? Um, basically, what I've shown you is that, that there's kind of a template um, which, is, which is given by the uh, asymmetry of dendritic structure, right, which gives you this impedance gradient, which together with the NMDA receptor channels gives you, uh, in turn, this, this gradient of integrative properties along the dendrite. And any... Um, non-uniformities in the density or distribution of AMD receptors are going to be superimposed on top of that. And you can either um, enhance the uh, functional gradient uh, 
with changes in the density, plasticity in the density of the MD receptor channels, for example, by having a higher density of channels in the distal dendrites, or you can counteract it um, by having, for example, a higher density in the more, more proximal synapses. And it's going to be interesting to see how different patterns of synaptic input uh, um, engage plasticity mechanisms to change the density and either enhance or uh, neutralize the, 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 this template that's already provided um, in every dendrite. Lily? I, I was a bit confused when comparing the first part and the second part of the lecture. In the first part, uh, you were showing that uh, uh, distal, that actually distal synapses are more effective in generating action potentials also in the slice. And if it is more effective, why do you need all these active mechanisms at all? in the second part. I mean, maybe, I mean, they are more effective. Why do you need, in addition, all these NMDA uh, spikes? <laughs> Well, you, with, with, without, without the active mechanisms, the distal, distal synapses lose. If you have a, just a passive dendrite, um, as expected from cable theory, um, uh, then essentially the, the distal dendrites have almost no impact on the output of the cell. So it's only with the active mechanisms um, that the, 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 the distal inputs can, can really have an impact on the output of the cell. And, um, you know, what, what I, to connect the two parts of the talk, essentially what I'm showing you is that, is that the, the same mechanisms that give you this, um, this gradient of integrative properties are also those that, that can help you to, to sharpen the tuning of, of the output of the cell, right? These NMDA receptor mechanisms are the same ones that are engaged with the, the physiological uh, synaptic inputs. What, what, I, what I cannot yet answer is whether um, what we're doing when we have the sensory input is detecting sequences of input, because we don't actually uh, uh, still know the spatiotemporal distribution of synaptic inputs uh, delivered by the visual stimulus to the dendrite. So I cannot yet tell you whether we're actually having some kind of a, a, a you know, engaging the sequence detection mechanisms that I've shown you in the slice um, in, in the visual cortical neurons in vivo. Yeah. Okay, I'm afraid we have one more question, and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 People see spikelets from this, so, so you, you must see that. And you don't see the dendritic spikes as spikelets. Um, it's uh, we're, we're looking for those, and and we we think um, occasionally we might be able to see this kind of somatic signature of, of a dendritic spike. But the trouble is in vivo that there's so much uh, synaptic input going on. Um, that it's at the soma going to be very difficult to cleanly discriminate um, a spikelet arriving from the dendrite from just a fast local synaptic event. So that, that's going to be a tough one to address. Like Michael Brecht saw them in the way. Right, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, he suggested that those, those particular spikelets might be coming from the axon, but there's no, there's no direct evidence. They could also be dendritic. So thank you very much uh, again, Michael. So to end this morning, this, uh, I would say, exciting morning and really uh, speaks to, to, to the vision where we are going to, we introduce an unknown member. Do you know him? I don't think anyone knows him here. But it's about 25% of ICNC when it started. I mean, one of four. <laughs> Uh, who started ICNC, and uh, I'm really happy to have here uh, Chaim to go from ICNC to ELSEC with revisiting the principles of sensory representations. Thank you, Chaim. Thank you. It has been a, a wonderful and intense uh, week uh, of really scientific festival. Uh, I therefore would like to uh, begin by uh, thanking the organizers, uh, primarily uh, Tali and uh, then Merav and Elon for organizing this, uh, uh, this meeting, this event, and of course Rafi, Ruti, and Elisheva, the administrative, administrative staff of, uh, of ELSEC for uh, making it happen. Uh, now, we had uh, throughout the week uh, also history and uh, stories and uh, reinterpretation of some of the names uh, this morning uh, and so on uh, I, I I will uh, I would like to move to to science uh, but but I would like to say one 
uh, to tell you one little short story uh, about uh, something which uh, I, I remember from uh, the, uh, the fantastic year, 1986 or 87, uh, at the Institute for Advanced Studies, the, the pre-ICNC uh, era. Um, and uh, throughout this year, we had uh, uh, also, it, for us, uh, for many of us, was the first uh, opportunity to really interact seriously with, uh, uh, with biologists, uh, uh, and, uh, but also, uh, of course, uh, a, a, an opportunity to uh, meet some of uh, new colleagues uh, from, from physics and, uh, of course, uh, 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 in particular, Larry Abbott, that uh, also was making his first steps into, into the biology, into the brain. Uh, and uh, some of those uh, uh, encounters uh, really uh, stayed uh, for uh, long-lasting collaboration, friendship, and uh, I would, would like to thank Larry for uh, being such a wonderful colleague and friend. Um, now, uh, we didn't invent theory of the brain. Uh, uh, we, I mean, neither ICNC nor, nor, uh, nor physicists, theoretical physicists. Uh, there have been uh, many uh, endeavors uh, to, to try to understand uh, how the brain work, uh, works. Uh, uh, cognitive uh, scientists, psychologists, uh, artificial intelligence researchers, uh, computer scientists, etc. Um, now, the question is what is unique? Is there anything unique which uh, uh, has been introduced into, into this? Uh, uh, collective effort, uh, uh, which was a unique, uh, special to, to, to the physicist uh, approach. Uh, and I think that I, I can illustrate this by uh, a, a talk that I gave at the same, I gave at the same uh, Batsheva seminar uh, on, on world computation. And it was, I don't remember, the, uh, some variety of associative memory model or Hopfield model. Uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, but uh, I do remember that I, I uh, stated explicitly some three uh, working hypotheses for my work. Uh, and here is the first one. The first one is that a neuron is a neuron. Now, what, what did I mean by that was that um, when, I, uh, am, I, when I'm considering or I'm presenting a, a network with, with units, um, I can, of course, say, that, well, these units are whatever they are, some collection of something, some patterns uh, across the brain. Uh, but uh, I think in order to make, I thought, <coughs> like in order to make a real progress uh, in, in, uh, in uh, bridging uh, these high-level theories uh, with reality, we have to make a commitment. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can always say, well, uh, I don't, I'm not interested in data. I, cannot, I can really test the models with data. Uh, and so the first uh, hypothesis was uh, that when I'm talking about a neuron, maybe it's a binary neuron or something, but uh, a point neuron definitely, uh, still I mean a neuron. I don't mean a unit uh, in the brain or some, some mysterious enti entity, not even X. Uh, I mean a neuron. Um, forgive me, Larry, for that. Uh, here, here was my second uh, hypothesis at the, same, at the same meeting, that a synapse is a synapse. Because you can, of course, talk about functional connections, whatever they are, mediated by something. But then how can you uh, test the model with, with biophysics or with physiology or with anatomy? Because you don't say anything about anatomy. So we have to make a commitment. And at that time, again, I was very naive. All of us were, were very naive, uh, romantic. And I said, well, a synapse in, in the model is really a synapse. Um, and the, lastly, I said, a spike is a spike. Well, we talked at that time about binary units, so there was zero, one. And I insisted when I say one, I mean a spike at some millisecond. Because again, if we don't, if we just say a state of a neuron, then who knows what it is? How can I test it in, uh, in, in real experiment? Now, of course, uh, so, so that's what I, uh, I, I, uh, I introduced this commitment. Now, this is very naive, and, and uh, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about other interpretations of states, maybe fine rate, and, and, and Larry discussed the, the relation between the fine rate and, uh, and the spike. And similarly, it, it doesn't mean that we are not allowed to talk about units, like Larry said, that a, a whole column 
or cluster of neurons as, as a unit in, in, uh, in a network. Uh, and similarly for synapses, it's, uh, it's, it's legitimate to talk about functional synapses, but the point was, and I think I, I, I would like to say the point still is that you should state what you think is the interpretation, the biophysical, biological interpretation of the terms in your model. And I think this is the core of the contribution of physicists or, or theoretical physics to the field. Uh, and this is the reason why this, this meeting can, can, can actually occur and, and uh, uh, to put uh, together in the same uh, room, in the same cultural environment, uh, uh, cognitive neuroscientists, psychologists, uh, uh, computer scientists, physicists, uh, uh, and of course physiologists and anatomists. Because we are talking ultimately at the same uh, phenomena, the same entities, the same reality. And, and I think this is something which we should keep in mind. So let me uh, then switch to, uh, to my talk. Um, I, I would like to actually, in my talk, raise more questions and suggest some, uh, some directions, but, but not that I'm not going to give you any definite uh, clear picture, because I think the picture today is still uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat confusing or, or, uh, or uh, ambiguous. So uh, this is about efficient coding theory of uh, sensory representations. And uh, it was, uh, uh, for, uh, for a long time, it was the anchored about the dimensionality reduction in one hand side and dimensionality expansion in the other hand side, and then Actually, both of them, but particularly the second one, the second one is also related to the notion of sparse neural representations, and these are the, the issues which I would like to uh, to uh, to focus on in my talk. Uh, <clears throat> so let, let me first uh, mention why this is important. Why much of the discussion of receptive fields, for instance, or also patterns of connectivity, were actually uh, associated with this issue, because it is uh, first of all a very uh, ubiquitous. Uh, uh, a feature of brain architecture. So, for instance, in the in the early visual pathways, we have the photoreceptor array, and then there is the uh, optic nerve bottleneck reduction of uh, hundred uh, factor of hundred and so, and then uh, a re-expansion uh, at the visual cortex. So there is a compression or dimensionality reduction, and again an overcomplete or expansive uh, uh, representation. Uh, this is uh, this is. Uh, uh, a slide uh, I got from Haggai or Nizar Bargad, who, who uh, uh, spent uh, a lot of uh, uh, time thinking about uh, the same kind of architecture in the basal ganglia. You have a, a compression from cortex to basal ganglia, and then re-expansion when it uh, 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 feedbacks to, uh, feeds back to cortex. Uh, there are other. Um, this is a slide I, I, I uh, borrowed from from Larry. Uh, there are other examples, and this is an example from the uh, early uh, stages of the olfactory system. This is in the uh, insects. You have the olfactory uh, uh, receptor neurons. Then you have a compression uh, into the, the, uh, um, uh, the antenna lobe uh, in the glomeruli, uh, and then re-expansion when you go to the mushroom body, the canyon cells, and you have a remarkable, and then, the, okay, these are the, the, the readout neurons in the mushroom body, uh, and then you have a similar, sorry, similar, hmm. Larry, you are too sophisticated with this. Uh, and there are the similar picture in the, no, in the, it should be, oh, here it is. Uh, in, the, in the mammalian brain, you have the olfactory receptor neurons, then you have uh, compression to the, um, uh, in the bulb, uh, and then you have re-expansion uh, by, uh, by huge factor uh, to the piriform cortex. Okay, so these are the themes. Now, finally, the, the example of, uh, of cerebellum. Uh, we have the input layer, the mossy fiber layer of uh, uh, several ten thousands, and then expansion in the intermediate granule cell layer, and then uh, finally a readout. Th these are numbers that are, are, are relevant to one unit or one readout, which is the, uh, the Purkinje cell. Okay, now, interestingly, uh, there has been, this is more speculative, but it has been suggested by uh, Fritz Sommer, based on uh, anatomical data from uh, Marco Fatal, uh, that uh, these kind of things actually happen uh, within cortex itself. That if you look at the uh, sort of infragranule 
uh, uh, layers or maybe local, uh, locally processing neurons uh, uh, within a, a, a cortical column uh, and you ask how many of the total column uh, actually how many axons project to, uh, to the to distal areas you find that a small number, a small fraction of the total uh, number of neurons actually are projecting to other areas so you can uh, also think about this perhaps uh, as, a, as a compression uh, uh, for communicating with, with the distal areas in cortex and then re-expansion when uh, at the target at the downstream uh, unit. So this may actually be uh, even more ubiquitous in, uh, in the brain, this, this theme. Okay, so what can we say about it? So uh, the, actually the, the most uh, uh, dominant theory is the principal component analysis. Uh, how to do dimensionality reduction when the principal component analysis, as you all know, says that uh, the stimuli that we are going to compress uh, has a, a low dimensional structure, a linear low dimensional structure. For instance, in this case, uh, each point is, is, is one a particular realization of a stimulus. It's two dimension, but uh, it actually lies in more or less in only this one dimensional projection, P1. And we can sort of ignore the other projection, maybe is noise. So basically, the, the stimulus space ensemble uh, has a linear low dimensional structure, uh, and, and, and therefore we can simply project everything in this case into one dimension, uh, and, 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 and that's it. So uh, we preserve the dimensions that carry most of the variance, this P1 here. Uh, this also decorrelates the signal, it, re it reduces or eliminates sec second order correlations in this uh, picture, and as I said, the geometric picture of the underlying stimuli. Uh, or stimulus ensemble is that they are lying in some low dimensional hyperplane. Hi. Yes. In, in the case of olfaction, there's in fact. I, I will come to olfaction. You passed olfaction. I'm, I'm just disagreeing with your point there. There's in fact no compression of dimensionality from the epithelium to the bulb. It is indeed from 20 million to. Let, let's. It, this will be the last slide of my talk and then we have discussion, okay? okay. Now, so. In recent years, there have been some new ideas in, in, in signal processing uh, about how to do dimensionality reduction and how to do dimensionality reduction uh, for, for signals which are not necessarily lying in this linear, uh, linear uh, hyperplane. Uh, but nevertheless, they have some intrinsic but nonlinear low dimensional structure. And what is surprising uh, in the compress sensing uh, uh, a result is that uh, when you have high dimensional data that, uh, uh, that have intrinsic nonlinear low dimensional structure that you can do uh, uh, dimensionality reduction. Uh, however, you can do it by simply random linear projections with minimal distortions of, of distances. So uh, this, is a, this is an example. Suppose you have, uh, your, sim your, your signals are simply points or point cloud in high dimension, so n is the dimensionality of the, the embedding dimension, how many components each one of these uh, 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 signals or data has, uh, for instance, the number of pixels in an image, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and suppose you want to reduce it to, uh, uh, to project them by linear projection to uh, a lower dimensional, n is the lower dimensionality. And what is uh, remarkable that in this case, the number of dimension that you have to keep uh, is proportional to the number of points and, and, com and, and independent of the, uh, the number of components, the dimensionality uh, of the signal. Um, now, uh, so, so this is, and, and furthermore, a very robust and maybe in some sense optimal way of, do, of achieving this compression is by simply random projection to the, to the low dimension. There are more uh, elaborate cases. This is an example of sort of sparse signals where again you have high dimensional signals, they don't lie in a low dimensional space like PCA, but they actually lie in sort of union of low dimensional spaces. So uh, they have small number of projections, but uh, some of signals may, have, may lie here, some signal may lie on this hyperplane, and so on. Again, you can project them to low dimension. The number of dimensions is proportional to this number of hyperplanes with an algorithmic correction, but uh, it's much smaller, the number of dimensions, to the uh, a number of components, the dimensionality of the signals themselves. And a, a famous example is the uh, images where you can have uh, in the wavelet representation only a relatively small number 
of some substantial uh, coefficients, and therefore you can uh, uh, you can use this uh, this idea uh, to actually this method to actually project and compress uh, images uh, according to this. This is. Uh, just to uh, an excuse to bring uh, the work of Sue Ganguly and myself in this uh, in this context, where we show that, there, uh, and, and others have shown as well, that there is a, a phase transition. So this is the fraction of non-zero components in uh, in the signal. This is the number of measurements or the dimensionality that you want to reduce to in normalized terms. And uh, if you uh, and, and they are related in sort of more or less linear fashion, in the sense that uh, once you go once you have a sufficiently number of large number of measurements above the, a critical line, you have a perfect, uh, you, you have lossless uh, 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 projection, compression, uh, which can also be uh, then reconstructed. And, and there is a whole, uh, of course, field and excitement about it in some, uh, uh, in, in some uh, 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 parts of signal processing community. Uh, this is just to show you that it doesn't necessarily to have even to be a sort of union of, of, uh, of hyperplanes. If you have uh, manifolds, the signals that lie in manifolds, you can again do this, these projections to low dimension. Uh, the projection again is more or less proportional to the dimensionality of the manifold. Let's say this is a two-dimensional manifold, nonlinear manifold in, in high dimensional space. But, uh, but, uh, but but not not being linear in the number in the number of components of the signals, and again, uh, as in the previous cases, this type of projection or dimensionality reduction can be achieved in a very robust way by simply random projections. Now, random projections simply means, uh, in, in 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 biological terms, by by a random set of synapses. You, you just take. Uh, in the downstream uh, an, a, a layer uh, of, of, of M neurons, you just take, uh, you connect it in a random fashion to the upstream, uh, uh, to the upstream layer. Uh, so, uh, so you have these two uh, conflicting views of dimensionality reduction, how to do it. Efficient coding theory says, well, signals are typically approximated by linear subspaces, and optimal projections uh, will maintain most of the variance, and they are adapt because of that they are adaptive because they, they depend on the stimulus statistics and, and TCA and compressed sensing theory says well signals are actually non-linearly uh, low dimensional an optimal projection should preserve geometric relation not statistics and random projection and particular non-adaptive projections are in general optimal so uh, the question is which one is more relevant or maybe both of them are relevant to uh, to to the brain so that's a few what? Can you give uh, an example? Of what? For, for these two specific predictions, like the compression? Well, I, let me give you an example here. If you do PCA, uh, you know what you do. You, have, you do a sort of center surround uh, receptive field, uh, and you just, uh, you know, you, do, you, you just project uh, by PCA. Basically, you throw away high frequencies. You project, you, you keep only the low frequencies on the, the low wavelength components. And, and then you, you form center surround receptive fields. If you do it here, you actually project them to a, a small number of randomly connected. Each one of this, uh, of this sensor will get random samples from, from, the, entire, from the entire image. Uh, and by, by mixing information from the entire image, the you problems. actually get, you get contributions from all wavelets, even the high frequency wavelets. The number of random samples you need equals to what? Well, this here is an example of a million, uh, a million pixel image, and you need only 25,000 uh, or, or so, uh, or maybe double, double this number uh, of, uh, of uh, sensors. OK. So I, I don't want to go in, into more details into that, just to show you that, uh, that uh, this, this, this gives us reasons to rethink, re-question some of the classical efficient coding theory uh, uh, a story about dimensionality reduction. Uh, let me just uh, mention uh, that if you look really at, uh, at the data, the, 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 the center surround receptive field, uh, which are sort of uh, the, uh, the prediction of the, of the PCL Infomax theory, uh, if you look at them, they actually decorrelate natural images. But some uh, analysis, careful analysis uh, shows that this decorrelation of the spiking outputs is largely due to spike nonlinearity rather than to the 
uh, input receptive field structure. So it's not obvious that the decorrelation that is observed at the level of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the correlation between, uh, between the spiking outputs of, several, of two receptive, of two ganglion cells is actually related to, uh, to PCA. I mean, it's still a question mark. Uh, so the question is, in the brain, are there random receptive fields in any, in any uh, region? We don't know. I, I, I don't know uh, of any clear evidence for that. Uh, and of course, the question is whether compressed sensing is, is valid, is applicable to uh, realistic neuronal circuits with all the nonlinearity which are involved. And finally, I would like, uh, I, I, my, my, my feeling or my intuition is that if you really think about signals that have both properties, they have this intrinsic nonlinearities of the type that I mentioned, but in, on the other hand, they have also significant second order correlations, the optimal dimensionality reduction would be something which is in between random and PCA. And, and this is uh, along the line of, uh, of uh, for instance, the recent work of uh, your Weiss and, and, and colleagues. Okay, so that's the, the end of the, uh, of the story of, uh, of my comments about the compression part of, uh, uh, of efficient coding theory. Now I want to switch to the expansion part. And there are many examples in vision, in cerebellum, uh, and so on. Uh, and I want to ask again, uh, the question is, uh, what is the uh, advantage of doing uh, expansion, uh, re-expansion, uh, and particularly uh, uh, where sparsity enters here, and, and, and are there better ways to do, expand, uh, to do this expansion of signals? Uh, should they be random, or, 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 or what, what kind of uh, alternatives are there? <coughs> this work is uh, done uh, with uh, 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 Bhaktash uh, Babadi at, uh, at Harvard, but it actually, <coughs> my war, um, the, the thing which I'll say, uh, are related to uh, many, uh, uh, many uh, groups uh, 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 in, the la in the previous uh, ancient history, but also in more recent work, uh, Mishat Sodix, Elizabeth Gardner, which I already mentioned, Old South and Failed, uh, uh, Fuzi and Omri Barak more recently, and Larry Abbott, uh, and, and also this, the, this times. So let me again switch to, uh, or just remind you of what efficient coding theory says about expansion. For instance, from uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, retinal ganglion cell layer to V1. Well, uh, they say that, uh, that the expanded representation is encoding the, the stimuli and images in the, uh, the, the encode, they represent explicitly the statistically independent features in an image, uh, which uh, is uh, the same as to say that they don't just do decorrelation of second order statistics, but they do really decorrelation of the high order statistics of the signal. And uh, as you all know, the, or most of you know, that uh, the prediction of the independent, the ICA, is that the receptive field that do this should have this uh, uh, Gabor-like uh, uh, receptive. They, they're again adaptive in principle because they are, are tuned to the statistics of the stimuli. Uh, and, and that, that's a very, nice, uh, a very nice prediction and a very successful uh, outcome of, uh, of this principle uh, of efficient coding theory. Now, uh, so, so what, is, what is the idea? The idea is that an image beyond the second order uh, statistics really is composed of, uh, of elements which are statistically independent. The, the image is composed from independent generators in the, in, in the environment that generates uh, 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 edges or maybe objects or faces or colors and so on. And what you want at the level of the expanded uh, representation to uh, represent those statistically independent uh, objects in an explicit way. Uh, and of course, uh, behind the whole uh, theme of decorrelation, second order and high order, uh, lies the, the, the pioneering ideas of, uh, of uh, Barlow uh, and uh, Laughlin and others. Okay, this has inspired also a lot of machine vision work in, uh, uh, in, in the field. Uh, they, they use, for instance, Poggio and Lacon and, and many others, uh, sort of fit forward network where you have an image, you convolve it with a set of features, with feature detectors which can maybe centers around or Gabor like filters, uh, and then you feed it into a, a, another set of sort of 
uh, uh, statistically tuned uh, features, etc., until you get to the output layer where you do some uh, some tasks. So this, uh, the first layers are sort of unsupervised. They they are tuned to the statistics of the inputs, and then the top layers uh, really uh, encode explicitly or learn the task. Now. Once again, in, in, in last years, there have been question marks about this, uh, about this result. So first of all, in the applied domain, there is a, a paper, this is an example uh, by Dobichers and, and company, uh, that say independent component analysis, this is uh, for engineering purposes applied to brain a functional MRI, which has been very successful, does not select for independence. It is actually e e efficient because it is representing effectively sparse components rather than independent components. So they suggest that although people think that, uh, that, uh, that these are good because they are representing statistically independent features of, the, of images, it may, it may not be the story. It may be simply a very uh, efficient sparse representation of an image rather than independent of what the statistics is. Uh, uh, similarly, for the kind of uh, multi-layer uh, machine, uh, multi-layer uh, uh, artificial network designs, people recently, recently people have questions whether you have to really put here Gabor filters or any fine-tuned features. Maybe you can just do maybe random c connections here, and that will that will be enough. And and actually, there are a, a study. Uh, a couple of years ago that showed that if you do some random filters, random uh, random patches, uh, in terms of successful uh, 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 performance on, 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 on several uh, benchmarks, you're doing as, almost as good as you can do by finding the best filters, Gabor-like filters or edges or whatever. Uh, and, and in similar, uh, in, in, in several benchmarks, for instance, here again, the random is doing 79%, but the, the best is 81%, etc. So, in the community, there is a still a question. So, there is a question. I mean, maybe we don't have to invest so much effort in fine tuning a set of filters or receptive fields, if you want, uh, and in order to represent an image, uh, maybe something more generic uh, can do the job. And, and of, of course, there is an ongoing debate about it. But that's sort of, again, uh, makes us, uh, uh, should make us think again about the efficient coding theory, uh, uh, whether this is the only perspective on the problem. Okay, now, indeed, this random idea uh, reminds us of, uh, of David Mars' ancient theory, maybe of, of the cerebellum, uh, that what, what the granular layer uh, uh, is doing by this expansion is basically random expansion uh, to intermediate layer and uh, it's also sparse, and, th and, and by doing this, by randomly expanding low dimensional input to high dimensional input, and, and you create a sparse representation of this input, you are making pattern separation. You take two nearby signals and you map them into, uh, 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 into far away uh, signals in intermediate representation, and that is great for computation, like classification uh, and recognition and so on, uh, without having to worry about uh, some structured or receptive field, uh, tuned receptive field uh, for, this, uh, for this mapping. Okay, so indeed, that's what is going on also, a, a debate within machine vision and pattern recognition. Uh, do you have to uh, do some uh, fine tuning of features or, or, or not? Okay, so what we are set to do, uh, uh, Bakhtash and, and myself, is to now describe uh, a, a synthetic model that will enable us to, to uh, formulate this in a more precise way uh, and study these issues, some of these issues uh, in, in uh, analytical understanding, quantitative understanding, etc. Okay, so, so here is the model. There is a, a, a set of inputs, so there is a layer of, uh, of inputs uh, uh, and with the low dimensionality input. Uh, this input uh, is, uh, is projected into an intermediate layer which is much larger in, in size than the input layer. The, the, this uh, set of connections, uh, a set of synaptic connections from, uh, from the dense low dimensional representation to the expanded representation are called J. And then finally, there is some, some computation that is done. So this is the 
the readout unit. So this K uh, layer uh, is, is, is indeed, will be learned by, by uh, tuning those weights to perform some, some tasks, some discrimination tasks and so on. But the, the main question is, what is going on here? What, what should be going on in this stage? Okay, so uh, let me be more precise. Uh, the neurons will be binary neurons, zero, one neurons. Uh, again, the dimensionality of this uh, dense representation, the input will be N, the dimensionality of the intermediate layer with G, and G will be much larger than N. We're talking about expanding, expansive, or uh, over complete representation. The sparsity, this will be sparse, so lambda, the, the percentage of non-zero units here will be small. That's why I'm interested to understand what is the benefit uh, for, for doing this, but this is what commonly is, is done. Uh, output is binary decision. So we just take one output and uh, we'll do some computation on this. And, and again, the question is, so this synapses will be learned, but the question is what, what to do with this synapses here? <laughs> okay, so if you, want, uh, if you want a concrete example, so our input layer will be the, uh, the, the bulb or the, the glomerular layer. Uh, this is the J mapping into uh, the mushroom body or the, or, or, or the piriform cortex, and then there is output, maybe the mushroom body output neuron or, or some neurons in the, in the mammalian brain, which we don't know yet, what are the real outputs, which actually do some comp computation, binary classification. For instance, their job is to take uh, an order and to say whether one, whether it's appetitive and, zero and, and negative or zero, uh, whether, whether it's aversive. So this is the K layer. Now, here we know what to do, more or less. I mean, this is a standard problem of classification in a single layer uh, a, a, a network. The question is, what is a good uh, re-representation at this stage? Okay, so we have to assume something about the structure of the input. And we are going to assume that the inputs are grouped into clusters. So this is now sort of abstract space space uh, uh, domain, not, not physical network domain. So we have sort of clusters. For instance, this can be a cluster around one uh, template C1, another cluster around another template C2, and so on. These are, you think about C1 as a template image or template order or, or whatever. Uh, so these are these clusters, balls in this n dimension. They are mapped into region in this uh, higher dimension G. Finally, we make a classification. So we want maybe this one to be zero and this one to be one. This is, uh, uh, and et cetera. So this is the, the readout. Uh, we are going to then, uh, I'm going to talk about measures of performance. So I'm going to denote the size of these clusters, the, of these balls, uh, by Q in. Q in zero means that's, that's a single template per cluster. To enlarge means that we are looking at a vast region, uh, sort of basin of attraction, if you want, of each one of these clusters. Uh, then we're talking about here, what's going on here. When you take a region here, a cluster here, and map it here, what is the Q in this, in, in this region? You can think about it as a representation arrow in the sense that uh, that points here may not actually go to one point here, but may go to nearby point here, so we are, we'll call it a representation arrow because ideally we would like to take the entire cluster and map it into one point here uh, and then and then finally finally a readout arrow q out there is more precise definitions but i'll skip that uh, so uh, here is uh, we talked about it so let's then uh, discuss the simplest uh, model which would be that we take this layer and we just project them into the G, the intermediate layer, by random weights, maybe Gaussians or maybe sparse Gaussian, doesn't matter uh, so much, but let's say random connections. Then what's important is that these random, these weights don't know about this cluster structure, they just simply uh, project them in random. So each neuron here gets a, uh, maybe some excitation from a bunch of neurons here, maybe some inhibition from other neurons, uh, etc. Uh, so, so let's first uh, talk about the noiseless case. So the noiseless case means that we really care about some number of templates and want to classify them uh, properly, ultimately, at the, at the output. Now, the, the, what, what turns out that for many sort of learning, learning at the, at the output layer, uh, 
uh, algorithm like perceptron algorithm or pseudo inverse, uh, indeed the capacity the, the, of, of, uh, of, the, of the system, how many patterns, how many templates it can classify correctly, increases linearly with the intermediate layer. So indeed, by expanding the representation, you can uh, increase the capacity in a linear fashion. Uh, this is maybe the, the famous perceptron factor of two, slope here, pseudo inverse factor of one. But what is remarkable is that basically you, what you do is increasing the dimensionality of, this, of the system, of the, of the stimuli, but the independent of the sparsity lambda. It doesn't really, the slope don't depend on the sparsity, and they don't really care if the connectivity <coughs> was done by random or by some other, other ways, as long as you did nonlinear mapping of your data into higher dimensional G. So, so this is, uh, in, in a way, doesn't, is not satisfactory in the sense that it doesn't give us a, a motivation why in the brain very often we see these sparse representations. Well, the answer in, our, in, in this model, the answer is that you should not look at just mapping single single template, but you'd look at the mapping a whole a whole cluster of inputs to uh, to the to to the right uh, to the right output. Okay, and there the behavior is really dramatically different. So if you, for instance, learn by some perceptron rule, uh, and you look at the classification error, the very uh, the, the very uh, last stage, and you ask how it does as a function of the size of the cluster, you can think about it as input noise if you want, but you see that there is a very poor performance, that small input noise, uh, small jitter in the input around those templates causes a huge uh, uh, error in the classification. Uh, and, and furthermore, and, and very often, depending on some parameters, you see that the sparser the representation is, the, error, the, 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 the larger the error is. So, depending on some parameters, the, 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 the sparsity may actually uh, harm the system rather than benefit it. Um, now, you can do uh, some more clever learning by, uh, well not, not more clever, but maybe biologically more relevant supervised learning here by Hebrew, and the results are very, very similar. So here again, input noise, readout error, there is very poor performance in general, and the sparseness uh, uh, is, is, is doing some, somewhat better here and worse here, but there is nothing particularly uh, exciting about it. Okay, so the next thing and the alternative uh, uh, suggestion is that this expansion should not be done, in, at least in this particular case, or, or, or uh, alternative uh, way to do it, is not by random projections, but projections which encode the s aspect uh, of the stimulus, in our case, the aspect of the, of the clustering of the stimulus, and with the way we do it by very simple unsupervised head rule, if you want. We, uh, we, we uh, learn those weights, uh, modify those weights, so to encode the, the product of the, of the, uh, of the input uh, uh, cluster uh, patterns and, the, and some randomly selected uh, representations here. So you imagine you start with some random into uh, uh, representations here, and then you start to modify those connections to encode this underlying structure. Still, those synapses don't know about the classification, aversive, ap appetitive, or yes or no. They only encode aspect of the structure of the input. And, and, and now the behavior is dramatically different. So here you see, again, the input noise, and here you see the output error, and you see that uh, uh, for, for dense representa intermediate representation, where half the neurons are active for each stimulus, uh, you see that there is a very poor performance, but for sparse representation, when lambda is small, you see that the error is, is very low until you go to some very substantial uh, uh, noise level or, or cluster size uh, at the input, uh, the system performs uh, uh, dramatically uh, uh, well. And, and similarly, for another supervised hem rule, Again, the, for <coughs> dense representation, the, the performance is poor, but for, la, for, for, high, for, for sparse representation, there is a very su uh, substantial suppression of the error that incurred by, by having those clusters uh, that need to be mapped correctly. Okay, now the question is wh why it is so? Why, uh, and why going from random connections, 
uh, to, uh, to these uh, structured connections uh, is doing the, such a big difference. Uh, and, and the answer is uh, that uh, it's really, if you, if you look at what happens in the, uh, in the uh, input, synaptic input to the neurons at the intermediate layer, you can see what, what's happening. So let's look at the random weights. Basically, the distribution of synaptic inputs, the total <coughs> synaptic input to one neuron versus the other, or for one neuron in all different uh, stimuli, has basically a unimodal Gaussian shape. And now you put a threshold to make it sparse, so all these inputs are mapped to zero, all these inputs are mapping to, to one, uh, so this is the way you, you, you sparsify the representation. Now, uh, if, if the sparsity is low, then basically the threshold is low, and a, and, and a, sub, a, a larger fraction of neurons in the intermediate representation uh, become active. Now it turns out, now, now you put a jitter, you put this Q, you put this cluster around, the ball around each one of the, of the centers in the input, and you, basically it means that you jitter this distribution. And, and you can easily see that here, the jitter is not so bad, the, the, change, the relative change is not so bad, compared to here. Here, the relative change that you do because of this tail uh, is, uh, makes enormous, uh, 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 enormous change in the representation. So high sparseness is more vulnerable to noise than low sparseness. And in general, both of them are, are, are vulnerable to noise, and therefore this is not a good representation, relatively speaking. On the other hand, this Hebgen synapses, what you get is a bimodal distribution, well separated. This is coming from uh, a one set of inputs for depending on the neuron, and this is from another set of inputs, and you put a threshold to make the neurons active here and not, and, and not being active here, so you can see that the, the higher the sparseness, the more separated these two are, and therefore uh, it is very resilient to noise. And, uh, and I, 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 I would like also to make at this point already, a prediction for, for biology that if you measure intracellular uh, by intracellular coding the synaptic input, the memory potential of the neurons in the intermediate representation to the target versus the null stimuli, you should be able to, uh, to, uh, uh, to test whether the situation is this or the situation is bimodal like this. And I think this, would be, this is a clear prediction uh, that will distinguish between the two cases. And again, you can, uh, here we just change the, the kind of task. Instead of saying appetitive versus, uh, 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 versus, uh, um, appetitive versus? Aversive versus aversive. Uh, suppose you just want to recognize a signal. You want to recognize um, an odor or, or, uh, or, or signal as, a, as an odor uh, again, the HEB, the structured expansion is enormously uh, uh, suppressing noise and can do a perfect job, uh, whereas the, the random one is doing relatively poorly in, uh, also in this task. But it limits your possibility of recognition. You have less possibility of recognition in the HEB case because you already done some. Right. It, all this is, is, is uh, conditioned on, on, on tasks, eventually tasks which are based on those structures. If, if, if it's not based on this structure, you don't lose anything okay. because you're, you're back to random. You will, be do, you will be doing as well as random. Yeah, but you limit your task possibilities. You cannot now do I'm saying if you do another task, then it will be like random. No. Let's discuss it later on. Okay, well, I just want to say uh, uh, one, one word. Uh, I, I, I had for the, for the sake of uh, the presentation and this diverse audience to simplify a lot the problem. The problem is, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is more complex and, uh, and in particular, I, I describe the performance of the system in both cases. One, whether this is random or, or structured, uh, I, I described in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of, the, uh, of the sparsity of this representation and the dimensionality of this representation. Well, the question is whether, despite the fact that you are doing a nonlinear mapping, uh, you may also, this is the question, do you have any trace of the fact that those signals came from this low dimensional input? And the answer is that there is a trace to that. Uh, and, and here I'll show you, uh, I'll show you a test for that. So 
imagine the following. Imagine in the mathematical uh, um, modeling we can do it, in, 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 in the brain we cannot, and nevertheless we're going to fix the representation here, the size and the sparsity, the type of connections and so on, but we're going to change the input. Now, does it matter? We have here a high dimensional representation, sparse, and, but we, 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 I mean, whether the input is actually matters, the, the original uh, uh, input, uh, input stage matters. And the answer is that does matter. For instance, here it is uh, from the input size 250 to 2500. You see that there is uh, a, a, a substantial uh, improvement uh, in the representation, in the, in the performance of the system. So mapping, for instance, what David Marr is telling us, from mossy fibers to granule cells or, or from, uh, from individual cortex and so on, those expansions are re-representing the input in a nice way, but nevertheless, they are not completely erasing the trace of the low-dimensional condensed representation that the signals originate from. Okay. So let me then summarize. So what uh, so far we, we have, uh, we understand that linear random synaptic projections are useful for dimensionality reduction of signals which are inherently sparse or uh, inherently low dimensional in a nonlinear way, uh, 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 neuronal signal representations. Um, this is the, the, the kind of, uh, of, of projections uh, and dimensionality reduction that comes out of compressed sensing uh, theory. Nonlinear random recording of sensory stimuli to high dimension increases the capacity for downstream computation. So one thing is, is clear that if you go from a low dimensional to high dimension and you want to do tasks like classification uh, and recognition and so on, you just increase the capacity. However, you have to ask yourself whether this is, uh, is providing a robust computation or, or it is sensitive to noise or to those clusters which I alluded to. And the answer is, so far, that expansion by random projections may be less beneficial for generalization, robust noise, clustering, associated memory, etc. And sparsifying representation created by random projections, therefore, has non-robust computational benefits. On the other hand, if you do it in sort of unsupervised Hebian manner, which you preserve the structure of the input, uh, provides a representation with high capacity for robust computation. And as I said, one prediction is it's very hard to look at a set of synapses and to say, well, are they random or they are, or they are Hebian? The Hebian is low rank, but as, as Larry pointed out, you can have a low rank in the background of some random uh, connection. So just looking at the synapses may not be a good way of actually uh, uh, distinguishing between these two uh, scenarios. But as I said, uh, I, I think if you look at the input to the cell and, and the distribution of the input to the cell for the target and null uh, uh, signals, you can, in the intermediate representation, one may be able to actually test uh, uh, which scenario applies, uh, is applicable in, 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 in a given system. Now, uh, finally, I want to talk about uh, Noam Sobel's uh, question. Now, is it relevant to, uh, is it relevant to, for instance, to olfaction? Uh, well, uh, it really depends on whether there is some interesting structure in the space of uh, olfactory signal or in the space of uh, uh, the, representation, uh, the representation at the bulb. If it's completely structureless, what you can do? Well, maybe random is, is, the, is the best that you can do. However, uh, we, can, we have uh, one of our friends here, uh, Noam Sobel and, and, and colleagues, uh, actually uh, have, have shown, uh, I think, suggestive evidence uh, that uh, even the olfactory space uh, has some low dimensional structure. Here it is in PCA. I, I would suggest, and we think that it is not really PCA, is not the, the good way to characterize the, dim the low dimensionality <coughs> of the olfactory structure. Maybe some more nonlinear structure. Uh, definitely at the level of the bulb, we have the neuronal nonlinearity in, uh, which involved in it. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I think those results and the ideas that Noam Sobel uh, 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 um, that put forward uh, suggest that unlike what we used to think that olfactory system is the canonical example of random representations or random signals which have to be learned by associative memory and nothing can be done beyond this uh, 
uh, uh, dealing with random, uh, uh, random si uh, signals, this suggests that maybe this is not true even for all function, that there is an underlying structure, uh, and if there is an underlying structure, low dimensional structure, it may well be, I don't know, that uh, we have some ideas about it, uh, that, uh, that this type of, uh, uh, of uh, connectivity, uh, suggested connectivity, non-random connectivity, <coughs> maybe is also applicable to the uh, mapping between the olfactory bulb and the piriform cortex. That's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chai. Yali. So I have a few comments. One is I want to congratulate you for demystifying the random uh, uh, mystique that's going on in the community lately. I think it's, a, it's not a good, it's a distraction. But I'd like go, to go back to your comment about the contribution of physicists. I think that you also have to bring back the contribution of physics that understands the primary role of invariance in understanding anything that's going on in nature. And that relates to another thing is that you should have put up Fukushima's model, not Kuchiro and Makun, because Fukushima understood. And in fact, I think that the narrowing is, an or is, is a step that puts an invariance. And then you have to project out in order to build the sparse features. But the narrowing is always a step of invariance. And otherwise, anybody who has uh, worked on you know, trying to really develop algorithms on a computer, you can't do it without that. OK, I, 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 uh, this is, of course, uh, at the be a beginning of a long discussion. I, uh, I fully agree with the importance of advances and, uh, and contribution <laughs> of physicists, but not only physicists, to highlight the importance of advances. I accept uh, the, the criticism that I should have put Fukushima. He is really the, the, the originator of this uh, uh, convolution and network idea. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I, I would like to, uh, uh, to contest your, uh, your premise that uh, compression is the only way or the primary way of doing advance. I, I actually think that uh, that uh, Fukushima, I in particular, is an example, or his model, an example of achieving invariances by the actual expansion. In his case, simply by copying the filters across space or across scales. And that's what is very often done in those types of networks. So actually, you create a redundant representation in the sense that you actually uh, map, copy filters across the dimensions which are, which are the, the invariance dimensions to, to create a truly invariant representation. So it is combination. You, you expand to allow you to overcome the invariance, and then you collect at the higher level by narrowing. Yeah. But you have to first do the expansion in order to be able to uh, compress them and have a representation ultimately which is invariant. Advances may be a good example for the limitation that uh, has your own. Maybe this is what happens in the brain, but you have to recognize that it limits your abilities to deal only with uh, objects or identities <coughs> that have statistical regularities. Uh, we see it as an advantage, but actually we miss, or brains miss, a lot of what's going on in the, in the world because of this. Or maybe. So, uh, possibly, but. but uh, my, my point, which is at uh, the moment, is, is that's a speculation, but I, I believe that uh, it, it is true that if I, that uh, although we applied our model to this uh, clustered uh, 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 type of stimulus, uh, of space of stimuli, I believe that it will also work. Oh, I'm doing this, but this is already oh, where it is. One, one more. Yeah, here it is. Uh, I, I think it will also work for this case. So if you have a, a, a if you have a compressed representation of signals which, however, intrinsically nonlinear low dimensionality and manifold dimensionality, which you can think about invariances, right? If you have invariance, basically you're saying that the manifold of states are coding the same object, right, for instance, okay? So I believe that this type of uh, 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 st hidden structure, manifold structure, will also be able to project by to, to expand. Now I'm talking about the expansion, right? <laughs> to expand, <laughs> to expand by non-random structured con uh, connection, and to uh, and to actually benefit from uh, this uh, this hidden structure 
in whatever computation you do, you do later on. But that's, that's the challenge that we are working on now, and, but that's our hope. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>